Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. I'm actually really excited for today's live stream because uh, we've got a little bit of some new gear, some lighting, so actually mostly stuff that we already owned, but we got our internet connection uh, beefed up. I got a new background canvas poster made, so I'm pretty excited about this. Um, it will be available for replay, and I'll definitely answer questions um, throughout if I can and towards the end. But today I wanna to talk about Lex, uh, the software that we built that really has become the glue of running Saunders Machine Works. Uh, I'm gonna switch over. I've got some like images and slides that I think will help kind of carry us through this. So let's see if I do this. Perfect. Hopefully everybody can see uh, and hear me just fine. And we've got the slides up now. So this, trust me, this is not just a PowerPoint, but I wanted a way to kind of capture some of the key moments because uh, frankly, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of what we've built uh, with Lex. Um, the team here has done a great job. Uh, it's called Lex because uh, Alex has been the one here that's done a lot of the heavy lifting. And we kind of jokingly called it light. ERP and then X because we're like, who knows what else this is going to do. Um, but really super cool. And I was thinking about what started all this. And it was this title. Uh, for a, a while, I was the only person that could order raw material. And that's super not sustainable as a small business. Um, by way of background, in case you only know us from the NYC CNC YouTube, uh, what I spend most of my time doing is helping run Saunders Machine Works. Uh, our primary product is fixture plates. We also have the ModVice system and about 30 other accessories or products that go along with it. But here's the crazy thing. Between all the different makes, models, sizes, and materials of fixture plates, plus all the ModVice versions and subcomponents, screws, fasteners, accessories, we have over 1,500 inventoried items. Uh, we're still a super small business as well. You know, we have far fewer than 10 employees, uh, about five to six full-time, and we've always been super active with interns. And I, I kind of can't believe it. Now that we've built Lex, I don't know how we even did what we did so long uh, without it. So I want to show more about how it works for us, but hopefully the takeaway for everyone here will be uh, to consider uh, what to look for and how you can start working on stuff now that can help you kind of set yourself up for success. Um, and we, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but we made one significant change to Lex about a month ago, uh, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So this is the old way uh, I used to order material. Uh, if you're a manufacturing entrepreneur or your job shop, I'm guessing you've done the same thing. I had notepad files or Excel files. Uh, this is kind of an old snippet of the ModVice bill of materials. Uh, and in some respects, there's nothing wrong with this. It's, it's not necessarily a terrible way to do it. Um, I was pretty judicious about getting the details right on this. And one of the things that we improved on partway through on this was having the yellow section down here where I would highlight stuff I needed to include in the RFQ or purchase order. So for uh, raw material, we found cut tolerances and uh, details about how we wanted that material to be ordered, how it to be cut to show up really, really helped. So um, I didn't deliberately know it at the time, but this is the kind of start of a process of how to uh, get stuff ordered. Um, but it was still not good. We sat down and we thought, wait a minute here, we need to make it way easier to buy stuff. Uh, and it's a concept that I think I first heard from Jay Pearson, uh, purchasing versus procurement. Switch back over here to live stream. So purchasing is just buying stuff, screws, fasteners, raw material. If it's on autopilot, you buy it once, you're gonna buy it again. You should create a process around that. Totally different mentality and uh, way of thinking about it than procurement, which may be like buying a new machine or something that's much more uh, capital in nature or requires a lot more thinking. So. We wanted to go about creating a process for how to do this. We sat down and we looked at pain points. So first pain point, 
I was the only one who could buy raw material. That's like a huge issue. If I was out of the shop or if I was busy or what vacation, whatever, not good. Um, and, but it's really way worse than that. People would be asking, have you ordered it? Has it been ordered? No one would know. You're, you're not sure. You would spend time asking. I usually wouldn't know the answer. So we would have to, I'd have to go look it up. Um, just not good. Then it gets worse. When is it going to arrive? Sometimes I had ordered it, but it hadn't arrived or we didn't think it had arrived. And I'd have to go look up that or I'd have to go track it down. Uh, and then even worse, there were times where we had ordered it. We didn't know where it was in the shop. Uh, and I think a couple of times uh, we had thought we were running out, reordered, only to realize that we had already reordered and there was a second batch of material. Now, since we're a product-based company, having an extra batch of material, it's not the end of the world. But still, this is not, you know, excelling at business. This is not good. And um, I wanted to fix that. Um, and lastly, as the guy buying the material, it's super helpful to know what did we pay last time? Uh, if you guys have followed the metals market and frankly, all markets, you know, look at McMaster pricing, the prices have changed a lot. Sometimes you don't control that, but nevertheless, it's really good to be able to immediately have that data uh, around. So um, before we decided to build Lex, we actually didn't really mean to even build Lex. Um, could somebody chime in? I see a comment, hello from Australia. I just want to make sure we're still good on the live stream quality here. Um, we, we really didn't want to, I had no interest in building an ERP system. We are not software developers, um, period. So, and I'm happy to go f more into this if folks want to hear it. Uh, we really looked hard at Odoo. Uh, it's, it's an open source ERP, but, um, it is usually sold and you pay for it through the company Odoo that is affiliated with the open source Odoo. Um, and it was great until we got into the weeds and we had quite a few meetings with them on this. And basically they were going to require customization where, uh, and this is a one year old information now, but if we had to have them do 12 hours of custom programming, it was a pretty expensive rate, quite a few hundred dollars per hour that was then billed either every month or every year repeatedly just to keep all of our systems up to date. So. There was not, there wasn't at the time good integration with our e-commerce Shopify. I wasn't interested in letting Odoo be our e-commerce. And it's kind of the overall theme of like, man, this is just such a one size fits all and it's expensive. And on top of expensive, they're feeing us um, on, I don't want to build a business right now that's obligating itself to lots of customization fees in perpetuity. Um, but I still don't want to write Odoo off long-term for us or others. And uh, Ryan over at Seneca Woodworking, uh, has become a pretty good friend. They are in the process of implementing Odoo. Um, I think they're gonna share more on it. Um, I'd like to go film a tour at their place and talk about his experience with it. So more to come on that. Um, there were two other options that kind of struck out in our research. Uh, NetSuite and Business One. I think these are Oracle and SAP, if I recall. Um, simply put, we weren't ready. They say that these are for small businesses, but you know, the definition of a small business includes employees up to dozens or hundreds of employees. We're, a, we're still a micro business. So uh, NetSuite and Business One were uh, looking at having consultants come in, five figure, you know, meaning $10,000 plus implementation plans, like they're meeting with teams of people. And I was just like, okay, whoa, 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 not us right now. Um, and then there are actually a number of, um, I would say pretty decent uh, ERP systems for job shops, um, pro shops, E2, job boss come to mind, um, but we're not a job shop and um, kind of just irked me. Like they didn't have public pricing and it kind of felt the same way where it's like, what is this, what am I buying here? Um, and I also just didn't love the fact that we would be building the backbone, the cornerstone of this business if it went well on a third party subscription service where I'm at their whims. Um, subscriptions are kind of hard to avoid these days on some things, but man, uh, ERPs, I just didn't love it. Um, but also we aren't a job shop. I've seen folks that are running job shops and are using some of the softwares and it's phenomenal. So, um, more power to them. It's also worth noting. You can talk about what an ERP really is. Uh, technically it stands for enterprise resource planning, but it's a little bit of a catch all phrase where, um, sometimes it like a true ERP system. I remember seeing this at Haas. They use, I think, SAP. It literally, it's really cool. It handles everything. Like it handles HR, accounting, invoicing, all the way down to um, 
to inventory management and like the barcodes on indicators that they use for asset tracking. Everything in that whole company runs through a true ERP system. A lot of the times when I see job shop type ERP systems, it really is more of like a material order planning workflow thing. So it's not necessarily gonna handle um, e-commerce or the front end of marketing engines uh, versus say software like Odoo that is a true ERP software. They have a option to do email marketing campaigns and to host your e-commerce or your website. So it's just worth noting how kind of crazy deep you can get on these things. Um, let's see here. So the DIY versions of some form of ERP software. Look, start with Excel. That was the key for us to start building at least the data set. Again, I think that's pretty obvious. Um, and then Asana and Airtable. I've got two little slides coming up here to talk about those. Um, I think they're great stepping stones and they may actually be fairly sustainable for folks. Um, ultimately for us, um, we had built our S tool system that tracks how we keep our cutting tools organized in a pretty simple SQL uh, database with a PHP WordPress kind of front end. Um, we're not software developers. This works, but um, it's it's hacky, I guess you could say. Um, again, we have some in-house knowledge on that, but Upwork is a great site. Uh, John Grimsmo and I have talked a lot about this on the Business of Machining podcast. Do not hesitate to hire an Upwork engineer. I think John's done things where he's had, for a relatively small sum of money, people build custom code that helps them integrate things, run run updates, interface with FANUC controls, with Shopify, with lottery generator numbers, uh, really pretty cool stuff. Um, so Asana is is for sure worth noting. We use Asana still to this day, um, although not for the portion here that we've since pushed into Lex, but we used to let Lex, uh, excuse me, Asana handle basically our, our job scheduling for priority and how we send things to certain different machines. And again, as a way of communicating, so Ed doesn't have to ask Grant or Julie doesn't have to ask Garrett where that plate is or when it's gonna be done. Um, and if a customer calls, I can log in and see what's going on with it. Asana is free. Um, I use it for organizing video projects and uh, stuff like that. So definitely check it out. I think it's fairly similar to uh, Trello. Uh, um, I think maybe Monday or Jira or other software I hear about in this space, but um, pretty cool stuff. And then Airtable is actually the really interesting one. Um, what's interesting is it's a proper database software, super easy to use, lots of tutorials. Um, it's either free or freemium, meaning it's free until you need a bunch of users or more functionality. Um, it supports some amount of web front end, so you can actually have uh, like customers push information into your Airtable database and so forth. Um, and then the key is they offer templates like this one I just looked up for this video. It's literally an inventory template. So you can start with that and customize it uh, on your own. So definitely look into that. Basically, I'm discouraging anybody from actually trying to build an ERP system until you think you're ready for it. Um, so, but let's talk about that. So what is Lex um, and how did it start? What we knew is that we needed a way to classify stuff. So this started back when we were just ordering, using Lex to order material. And we, uh, we decided A numbers would be an individual item. Um, so like buying a raw piece of material that gets later machined into a Modvice. The B number would be what that is after it's been machined. So uh, Modvice soft jaw starts as a chunk of aluminum. Uh, as an A number, that's what we order from our aluminum supplier. And then when we machine it, it, it gets finished as a B number. Things become a C number, which is a subassembly that then go into an S number, which is a final product. So with rare exception for everything that we have as an S number means it's something that we can literally pick up and drop in a box to send to a customer. Um, we then added T's numbers for like tooling the supplies because we use Lex to buy end mills and paper towels. And then O for outside service, like sending stuff out to get anodized. Um, so how does Lex work at its core? If we need Modvice soft jaw material, actually this is now out of date, but I wanted to put this in uh, here because this is how we use Lex for almost a year. If we needed Modvice raw material, the reason we would know that was because uh, whoever was running those saw that we hit a Kanban reorder trigger or uh, we just knew, I'll come back to that weakness. You would then either scan with a barcode or usually we just typed in that uh, probably an A number and that would then push that item into an order queue. For raw material, it would be an RFQ. Uh, Lex lets us send 
a raw material out to multiple people to get quotes on it, which is great. Um, if it was something like a screw that we buy from a vendor, it would just go straight to a PO, but in an order queue. Uh, me or Julie or somebody else would then periodically look through the order queue and decide when we wanted to push it. Um, that process could be automated, but we've to this day not done it because it doesn't take any time and we like that human touch of looking at what needs ordered. What we did do is create an alert where if something sits in the order queue for longer than a few days, I think uh, it lets me know or somebody else know. That way we don't, again, let things sit in the order queue without getting ordered. What's great is Lex closes the loop. So once it gets ordered, it goes into an inbound, um, it goes into an inbound status. So I know to be waiting for it. And oops. And then uh, once it comes in, I'm trying to switch my view here, guys, sorry. Um, once it comes in, I'm able to then, uh, or anybody, frankly, is able to then tag it in. So that's part of the key. If we order 100 pieces of material, it lists as inbound. We can see what we're waiting for. When it comes in, um, we scan it in. The PO that we sent to the company has our Alex number on it. So it makes it really easy uh, to look at what is coming in. And then I embedded a little video here uh, showing this is me manually printing a label, but when we're checking stuff in, uh, when you confirm that you've received it, it gives you the option to go ahead and print the label right away. So this is an S number label for a Modvice. If you've bought a Modvice from us, you've probably seen this label on your box. Um, but these exist for A, B, Cs, etc. And uh, the picture on the right there just shows the best way we found for raw material is we just put that label on a scrap piece of wood. And that works great for big pallets of like fixture plate material for um, smaller stuff that comes in boxes. We put it on the cardboard box or the red bin that we buy from Uline just again to keep things labeled. Uh, side note, we have location tracking in Lex. We actually turned it off. We weren't using it. We haven't had an issue of knowing where stuff is, but we were always thinking about how you make sure that this is scalable, where if you have a big enough place or um, you know, one person puts something away, the other person's not gonna know where it is necessarily. Um, so that functionality is there. Uh, let's see here, what's next? Okay, so this is actually really cool. Uh, this was a huge change. Um, until about a month ago, Lex was what I call a dumb system. Uh, it did what we told it to, or we told it what to do. So uh, in that example with a Modvice, if we ran out of Modvice top jaw material, it was up on Ed or Grant or somebody to realize we were low on it and type in that number. We started thinking about trying to automate some of that and we realized the only way to do this is to go all in. So for the last month, Lex is fully autonomous. So what I mean by that is, if you go on our website right now and you buy a Modvice, it will, um, Shopify will sell you one. It will then deprecate or reduce the value of Modvice inventories in Shopify by one. And then the Shopify API will push that into Lex. Lex will then deprecate the S value by one as well as all of the sub assemblies. So the top jaws, the bases, the screws, the washers, the uh, everything, the boxes even. And if those sub assemblies hit trigger quantities, it will automatically generate the appropriate action. So if it's for screws, it'll generate a PO. If it's for things we need machined, it will generate a work order. If it's for things that we need quoted, it'll generate an RFQ and it cascades or flows down. So if those work order was to make something and to make it, we need a material, but to make it the material, we need to order more material. It orders or puts that into the order queue, uh, which has been absolutely awesome. The first day we turned this on, there were definitely some hiccups, but um, it, it was absolutely the way to go because Lex now has intelligence over everything. It knows how many screws that we have in stock, how many cardboard boxes we have in, uh, how much material we have in, uh, and so forth. Switch back here, sorry, to the, uh, cool. So what's next? Um, John Grimsman and I uh, do our podcast every week and he mentioned something this morning. This podcast will air this Friday. Um, he mentioned something that I loved. What gets measured gets managed. Uh, this is not why we originally made Lex. Um, it was something I had sort of thought of, but Lex lets us manage things better without ever feeling like we're managing stuff. Um, because we now know everything. Case in point, um, 
The next bullet point, Lex shows us trailing sales and our buying history. When we went, when we went full nuts a month ago with the API integration from Shopify, uh, which was not that, that difficult. Uh, Shopify has a great and well-documented API. Um, we pull in trailing sales. So as an example, I needed to reorder material for uh, one of our fixture plates for the hobby machines. And I was like, I wonder if we should buy 30 pieces of it. And right there in that same window was our trailing 90, I think it was trailing three months sale. So that immediately told me how much material we've, or how much we've sold, which helps me make a better educated decision on how much we should buy. Um, we also have an issue right now where when we hit work order triggers, we, it's not totally clear what should be made first. So what we thought about, we haven't implemented this yet, but I think it's actually pretty simple, is a kind of an urgency metric, which would be uh, trailing sales divided by quantity on hand or something like that, because um, we may hit trigger points, but depending on how many we've been selling tells, tells us maybe how more, much more important that is. Um, and then lastly, I, um, I love Lex. I love how intelligent it is, but I'm also a big fan of the human touch. So what we've done is started to look at things like making sure Lex can still let us know when we need to know. So um, if we hit quantity zero on something, we think that's a big deal. Uh, we've really tried to build Saunders Machine Works on uh, one of the key pillars of having stuff ready to ship. Um, and so if you buy a VF2 plate or a Tormac 1100 plate, um, our website shows if we have it in stock. Hopefully we do have it in stock and we get it shipped pretty quick. If we run out of stock, we want to know. And I don't just want that data to get lost in uh, the noise, especially if it's something that we sell a lot of. Um, so what we have an idea of is a simple email, like an intelligent email, um, not just a generic report, but an email from Lex to me or to Julie or to Ed saying, um, hey, Ed, we are currently out of steel VF2 plates and we sold this many over the last uh, three weeks. That lets us come in with that human element and decide uh, we should figure out why that happened and what we need to do to get that made. Um, next up, it was an easy and natural extension to include maintenance in Lex. Again, I wanted to build a process around this. There's stuff that we wanted to do uh, from a maintenance standpoint where I was putting it in a personal calendar or asking other folks to do it. Um, super easy to do. This also could be done again easily in things like Airtable where every month or week or even every year, um, you know, I work for or Grant or Ed or Garrett works for Lex. It just tells us, hey, every year we need to drain the hot water heater or change the filters on the rooftop air conditioner or lube, um, lube the draw bars and so forth. So makes it, um, which is wonderfully easy. I think that's all I got. So um, what kind of questions that you have? Ooh, I'm, I'm chiming back in on the comments now that I'm here. It's always hard to read while you're, uh, while you're talking and presenting. Um, first of all, I love this, guys. I'm super excited about the, uh, the new um, uh, internet live streaming here. I'm going to reset my camera real quick because otherwise it will shut off on its own. So I'll be right back here. You'll probably get the blue bars. Um, but I'm happy to stick around here for a few, a few more minutes to see um, what kind of questions you guys have. Ryan Winter is mentioning what gets measured gets managed is he thinks from a Peter Drucker book called The Effective Executive. Um, like Butter is mentioning that they hit their automation limit pretty quickly with Airtable but very happy with what you made and feels like you're only scratching the surface for sure. I've seen some Airtable stuff done that blew my mind uh, around organizing like cutting tools and um, tickets and job queries and so forth. Um, yeah, John, John, uh, excuse me if I mispronounce this, Ranaletta mentioned had two client CEOs fired because ERPs ran over budgets, bake your own or change the business to fit, do not customize purchased ERPs. What I've heard from like friends that work for big corporations is that um, that's what they do though. Like if you're a, if you're a, a company that has 50 or 200 employees and you hire uh, an SAP to call, tell them to come in, it's like a year long process of them integrating, customizing, training and so forth. 
Um, what is Lex programmed in? So the data is in a SQL database and then we just use uh, kind of a combination of basically the WordPress front end that uses PHP to talk to the, to between the two. Um, Matt asks, um, do you have any long-term goals to potentially resell Lex? So we've gotten this question. Um, the direct short answer is no. Um, what we want to do is share what we've learned to encourage folks to kind of do this and roll this on their own. Um, Lex is meant for us, both in that it's kind of for fixture plates and how we run Saunders. Um, but honestly, way more importantly, we're not software developers. Um, I was talking about what it would take to kind of even start turning some of this over. And this is, you know, it's hosted on a local server and it's no, we're not software developers. So um, we don't have a business case or plan around how we would um, even go about doing that. And for sure, we're focused on building our fixture plate business. So um, that's the, the no kind of no BS answer, but there seems to be a ton of interest around this sort of topic. So uh, I wanna encourage folks like, for us, it just started with buying raw material. Um, I heard, I think it was also Jay Pearson talked about having just a simple email thing built where he has the products he needs to buy, all of the information is saved in a template format with the specs and so forth. And when he needs more material, it just sends off an email. That's like ERP Lite and, and I love it. And you'll end up building that into something else. Um, and look, we we have thought about what Lex doesn't do. You know, it doesn't tie into our accounting. Um, that's a potentially big problem because for example, we would end up paying an invoice even if something didn't get delivered. Um, and so part of me thinks, hey, maybe one day we end up just porting Lex over to a real ERP system and we'll be way better off and I'd be willing to spend the time and money because now we know what we want. Um, so I'm reading through some comments here. Do you, do you still have a staff member on Lex full time and how much upkeep? Um, we have, oh, sorry, my lights went out here. Um, we have kind of part time, if you will. And again, you gotta use sites like Upwork when you get stuck or need help on stuff. Um, but no, it's not a full time thing right now. Chris K asks, thanks for the presentation. Are the processes you described hard coded in Lex or do you have a functionality to configure? Oh, so we definitely have a functionality. So in Lex, we can just go in and manage these. So I can add a new maintenance task of every week to take the trash out. Um, and I can change who that gets emailed to, how often it's done, uh, and so forth. Third party ERP or PDM systems are so frustrating. It gets super expensive, special functionality, yeah. Again, that's what I've heard. I remember touring um, SNH machine, gosh, probably three or four years ago, that job shop down in LA. Um, they had built their own, I, again, I don't think they necessarily meant it to be a full-blown ERP system. It was more of a reporting and data system. And I'm pretty sure it was Apple's FileMaker Pro. And um, I've heard these little nuggets about how folks had built, used built, custom-built software to kind of help them do what they do. And that was kind of what made me realize, um, oh, let's do this. And I actually think I neglected to mention in this whole video, we only built Lex as a proof of concept to show the actual ERP companies like Business One or Odoo what we wanted it to do. Um, that's what I had Alex start with was I was like, let's just see if we can get this working to help us know what we really want. And, and literally we've never looked back. Um, how are you quoting non-standard products uh, are you using custom software utility? So for custom fixture plates, yeah, it's actually still kind of a Excel or Google Sheets process. We built some processes around um, how we come up with that quote and how we have the customer sign off on drawings. And then as soon as it goes from a quote to an order, it gets moved into Lex. Um, okay, Hunter K has a great question. Not an ERP question. Actually, I think it is. Do you... Do you feel an inventory management system is overkill for small, single person hobby job shops? Um, I mean, if it's just you and you're not doing a lot, meaning selling a product and so forth, it might be overkill. But as soon as you need to start reordering stuff or tracking stuff, um, you know, one of the things that we have the functionality to do in Lex, but we haven't done is all of our toolbox, toolboxes can kind of get moved into Lex. So when we have a new intern or employee start and they're looking for a draw file, they just search draw file and it tells them it's in the black Husky toolbox drawer three. Um, we're not going crazy with digital toolboxes, um, but you know our files haven't moved in, from the toolbox drawer in six years, but I don't want to have somebody else um, always feel like they've got to ask somebody else where every little thing is. 
And so looking at how you can build really intelligent systems as a solopreneur to help you efficiently reorder stuff, track it, you know, sending out quotes. I wanna know if someone didn't get back to me by having Lex tell me, not by thinking and trying to track in my head, oh man, did that guy get back to me on that quote? Uh, Andrew mentions using used Odoo was overkill. Used Google App Maker to give us a front end GUI and pull data in from Google Sheets. That's awesome. I didn't even know it about Google App Maker, but something like that can, that can act as a front end to Google Sheets sounds uh, great and potentially kind of like the Airtable uh, solution I was mentioning. Oh, App Maker App Maker is no longer supported, but there's another third party company offering the same thing. And Andrew, would you mention who that third party is if you don't mind? Um, Chris Bird asks, do you use it for tracking carbide invills and inserts time used on the item? We, we do not. We use it to buy cutting tools from some of our vendors, not everybody. Some places we actually still buy through uh, just the website. Um, but no, Lex is not doing what I would consider statistical stuff on how long things take to make them um, or carbide usage studies. Uh, it, it could. We're kind of backed up on Lex functionality, so um, not on our radar right now. App Sheets is what it's called. Um, I tend to not scroll back up too much, folks. So if you asked a question that I didn't get to, for sure, chime back in. Um, yeah, Chris, we do use it on, well, um, we aren't really using it on end mills. So like if we buy 10 drills, um, we're not having Lex, not, that we don't have the workflow right now where folks are like scanning to, um, to reorder another drill. Everyone just handles that here on their own. That, that works and will work for quite a while. What we did think about with Lex is we use a Sandvik insert drill for drill most to drill most of the holes on our fixture plates, and that um, insert drill soft body does not last forever. I think we replace it like every 15 or 20 insert changes, which no one remembers that. Um, Lex has the functionality, <laughs> we're not using it right now, to where we have a barcode on the machine, and every time you switch the drill insert out, you just scan that barcode, and it keeps track in the back end, and then it will tell you hey, you just hit 15 insert changes, go ahead and get a new, uh, replace that soft body. Um, oh, Jason's asking, do you have any plans to incorporate quality of parts into Lex? Yes, Lex actually handles all of our QC now. So um, when we finish a fixture plate that's now created from a work order, that work order gets moved into quality control. So the quality control stuff is in Lex and that's in a digital format. So the big thing for us, like checking the parallelism of the plate, that's digitally stored, it can be tracked over time, uh, and it's way better than paper sheets, plus obviously we can search it, we can tie it to work order numbers or Shopify order numbers. Um, any advice if somebody wanted to start a company doing software for shops? Uh, you know, for us, um, it's kind of like fixture plates. I was looking back to a, the, my first tag in New York City and I saw a fixture plate and I was like, that makes sense. And I bought it, um, you know, kind of build and do what you use and love. Um, you know, you could probably make an argument that it could potentially be more p profitable for us to stop doing everything we're here at Saunders and go turn ourselves into a software company for something like Lex. I don't want to do that. I like making stuff and focus on this business, but um, get smart on it and, and go do it um, would be the answer there. I think there probably is a fair amount of room for disruption. Do POs or emails get automatically generated and sent when your inventory is low and how do you manage to change in pricing? So POs um, are not totally automatically done. They could be. We have them, uh, we don't have that feature turned on at the moment because it's so easy for us to go look through uh, what needs ordered and I like that human element. But work orders, and the same thing actually, work orders get automatically created but then they get moved into a kind of purgatory status where we go through and manually just make sure that's all correct. Um, we'll move on from that soon, but what I don't wanna do is accidentally have somebody make 200 of something that we didn't really need. I tell you, it's awesome. I, we were seeing folks on Instagram being like, we're waking up at 5 a.m. I don't know where you are if it's 5 a.m. to watch this, but um, it's, it's kind of blown us away at how uh, much interest there is on this. So 
Um, you mentioned how this would scale down. How would it do scaling up for larger business? Um, I think Lex would scale up fairly well. There's definitely some programming limitations um, that are beyond our ability with multiple users or um, there's a couple weird bugs where if we refresh something, it could um, duplicate the um, d duplicate the task, which we don't want. Um, I think for me, the biggest um, hiccup is the accounting side of things. You know, for companies that are ordering literally, you know, a manufacturing company that's ordering potentially thousands or tens of thousands of dollars of material or stuff per week, um, you really want the accounting system tied into your ERP system. That way an invoice isn't able to be paid until it's marked as received or something like that. Um, so Inlex could kind of sort of tie into that, but for sure the businesses that I've seen that kind of from the ground up use something like SAP, um, all of that's the same system. It, it, again, it's kind of kind of cool, but kind of crazy to me to think that you, the same software handles marketing as HR and payroll and um, asset inventory and so forth. Tim mentions, I followed you from the beginning. Lex sounds great. Missing the accounting is a big hole. Yeah, I hear you. Um, we also like our zero accounting software right now. So um, give it a look if you need a full ERP. Uh, which Tormach is using for the business. Tim, which, which ERP were you mentioning that, that you're referring to and that or uh, Tormach's using? Um, if SAP were cheaper, would you have considered them? So the answer is no for two reasons. One, my understanding is that SAP is generally sold through like a consultant or a reseller and that process looked like it was going to be, again, a team of people and you know $10,000 plus for an implementation package and we just wanted to start building Lex to order aluminum. I got tired of copying and pasting things out of a cell. There's a big disconnect. Um, where we are now with it, I could have a very intelligent conversation with somebody and get a much more good answer of what we need it to do. Um, but again, um, Lex is working pretty well for us. Um, uh, Acumatica is the ERP that Tim was referring to that Tormach uses. Um, I'm going to wrap up here in the next like, two minutes, um, but get your questions in if you have questions in. The other thing I'll throw out, um, I want to do some more videos talking about the business side and the operations side of, of Saunders Machine Works in, in hopes that it kind of helps um, answer and uh, tackle t subject matters for other folks out there that are running shops. The next one that I have on mind is um, thinking about preparing for a downturn. And one of the th reasons I like that idea is that no one's expecting a downturn. I know, I know everyone's kind of on edge with COVID, but it's been such a strong year, year and a half and 12 year run. Um, I think it's one of those like, okay, let's be counterintuitive and let's think about, holy cow, what happens if things slow down a little or maybe a lot? Um, what are we literally doing to make sure, um, I wanna be here for a long time doing this. Has anybody here used Fulcrum ERP, asks Henry Holsters. If anybody has, chime in. And then Chris asks, are you familiar with Microsoft Power Automate and its robotic process automation? Great for stitching together processes across software platforms. So that's super cool. Um, I, I kind of acknowledge I'm at that age where I'm just not as in the loop on stuff as I wish I was. There are these um, app companies as well, not Zoomiers, something like that, which can there are these like widget apps that you pay for and they can connect uh, Asana to If This Then That or Shopify to Google Sheets or something. Um, maybe that's part of what Power Automate is. So rock on, that's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm not in the loop on it. Jake asks for some proven cut recipes. Uh, shoot a recipe request over. We're, Vince has been crushing it on adding recipes um, and so forth. So let him know what you're looking for. Um, like Butter and, and Henry, you guys are saying that Fulcrum was great, but too much money. Zapier, thank you. Any, you guys mind sharing um, what it costs? That's one of the things I love trying to share the information on is what do these things cost? Because man, these um, sites that don't tell you anything, uh, even, the, even the job shop ERP systems, it's like a black box of, of what the subscriptions look like. Mm -hmm. 
we do have a metric version and of the quarter inch mod vise and yes we ship all over the world i don't think we have a metric version of the inch right now but for sure on the radar um, okay, I'm not seeing other questions trickle in. So if you guys want to see more on Lex or other business topics, for sure, reach out. Uh, let us know. Um, NetSuite costs sixty thousand dollars for a company plus monthly maintenance. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, yeah, Chris, I was referring to the hobby mod vice right there. Um, oh, now the questions are coming in. Do we plan on discussing additive machining? Um, we do 3D printing at just the basic FDM level. I don't think I have a lot to add there um, other than we found a ton of good uses for 3d printing in a machine shop um, but i love seeing the laser sintering machines and, and where that's going fulcrum is priced in tiers based on your size with recurring monthly fees for integration it sounds pretty much like the normal answer fulcrum is going to start at 500 dollars per month plus thousands in integration yeah that's what i'm hearing from others uh, R3VO, I'm currently looking for a way to improve file management on our servers and local PCs. They tend to get cluttered and we're having trouble finding files. Um, look into a PDM system. The one that I absolutely seem to hear the most about is Autodesk's Vault. Um, but I don't know a ton about PDM, so um, I am I can't comment more. Jake, for sure, reach out to Vince, though. I'm not going to um, mild to recipes. Just let us know what kind of machine you're looking for uh, and more specifics on tooling and so forth. Uh, would I consider designing and selling my own line of desktop machines? Maybe, maybe in another era. Um, I'd be lying if I said I hadn't thought about it, but um, it is incredibly uh, tall order to completely build, design, and bring to market a CNC machine. Uh, building the machine isn't necessarily the craziest hard thing, but building your workflow around a company around design through selling and support is, is nuts out. Um, for a job shop, would you suggest learning how to build an air table for an ERP or go something like E2? Four person laser shop kind of here. Dude, absolutely build an air table. I bet you in a weekend, you'd be blown away at how much progress you can make. Uh, build it, find out what you don't like, hire an Upwork person to fix that stuff, outgrow it, and then when you outgrow it, go go with E2. Um, Data Proto mentions that they use Autodesk Vault for uh, document management and it works great. Yeah, um, ERP systems, Kind of like PDMs, you always tend to hear the negative stuff, people complaining and training and costs, but Vault, I've actually uh, heard mostly decent things about it. So if you're not familiar with PDMs, go watch some YouTube videos on Autodesk Vault. Um, otherwise, I am going to call it a day. As always, folks, seriously, I'm incredibly grateful. I, I love what I get to do. I mentioned it to John Grimsmo. I've kind of got this renewed sense of energy around what we're doing here. Um, it's super fun. I'm happy we've got this live stream set up with higher internet speed so that we can stream with good quality. Um, so let me know what you guys want to see on business topics um, and operations type stuff, and we'll keep this going. Otherwise, take care. See you soon.